In 1992, Nintendo took a chance on a small company that had faithfully stood by its side since it first decided to go into the console market 10 years earlier. Back in 1983, at the introduction of the Famicom, Nintendo was in need of development studios to make games for its new system, including its own games. However, the processor Nintendo had chosen for the Famicom was chosen more as a result of its low cost to produce than due to any technical merits or wide acceptance in the developer community. One person who had a deep working knowledge of this chip and how to program it was Satoru Iwata, a technical wonderkind at a small company called HAL Laboratory. Iwata had bucked the trend in his native Japan and chosen the American Commodore PET as his preferred computer, and that computer just happened to have the same central processor as Nintendo's new console. Iwata and HAL Laboratory would go on to have an extensive relationship with Nintendo early in the Famicom years. Although many of these games were published by Nintendo, they played a crucial role in developing them, and those games went on to play a crucial role in the uncertain early days of the Famicom and the NES once it came to America. These included Pinball, Mock Rider, Golf, and Balloon Fight. But HAL Laboratory was still technically an independent company, even if it was standing so close to Nintendo that most couldn't tell. The company did release its own games on the Japanese MSX personal computer system and published some of its own Famicom games independent of Nintendo, some of which even came to America, like The Adventures of Lolo. It was this streak as an independent publisher that brought the company to the edge of the abyss in the early 1990s, as a studio made up of mainly technical mavens had overextended themselves on ambitious projects, such as the largest and most expensive Famicom cartridge game to ship in Japan called Metal Slater Glory. They had also gotten caught up in the development crunch cycle of shipping products before they knew they were done in order to meet deadlines, which in turn resulted in declining sales from inferior products. By 1992, this placed the company on the inevitable path of bankruptcy. That was until Nintendo stepped in. Nintendo essentially bailed the company out. It took over marketing and distribution for HAL, and floated the company long enough for it to take a breath and get back to basics on making the best games it could. To ensure this, Nintendo had one demand for the fledgling little developer. Satoru Iwata had to assume the role of president, which he did. In a later 1999 interview, Iwata would say that his mantra after this angel investment from Nintendo was that every game HAL set out to make from there on out would aim to be a million seller. It just needed a game. Into this crossroads came a fresh-faced 19-year-old named Masahiro Sakurai. The newest employee of HAL Laboratory would pioneer the development of a brand new game with an all-new character of his own design that would go on to be a major hit for Nintendo's portable Game Boy system. That game would be Kirby's Dream Land, and would introduce the world, and Nintendo, to the pink platforming hero, Kirby. It was also the game that would signal a renaissance of sorts for HAL and their partnership with Nintendo, as they would pump out a plethora of new Kirby games for the Game Boy, the NES, and the Super Nintendo over the next five years, in addition to a very well-regarded but unapologetically weird RPG called Earthbound. By 1996, Nintendo was moving on to its 3D powerhouse, the Nintendo 64, and the industry as a whole was moving on to three-dimensional games. For HAL, this proved to be a challenge, since working with the more technically complex world of polygons was difficult for all developers that had previously become accustomed to working only in two dimensions. On top of that, Nintendo had a confused and divided strategy for software development going on behind the scenes when it came to the Nintendo 64, since they had planned the system itself in conjunction with an add-on console known as the 64DD, or 64 Disk Drive that would replace the cartridges with much larger magnetic zip disks. This resulted in serious divided efforts for Nintendo and for many of its partners that threw away significant development cycles on games that would never be released because the platform they were aimed at was essentially cancelled, only to see a limited mail-order release in Japan in the very last year of the Nintendo 64's lifespan. This doomed many of HAL's games it had under development, including the infamous Mother 3 that would never see the light of day outside of a few trade shows. So now the year 1999 was on the horizon. The Nintendo 64 had been around for almost three years, and HAL Laboratory had yet to release a single game for it. It was at this point that the spotlight again turned to Masahiro Sakurai. 
Back when the company had first received its Nintendo 64 development kit in 1996, Sakurai had begun toying with the idea of developing a fighting game for it. A fighting game that he wanted to be different than other fighting games at the time, which focused on the competition between the lightning-fast reflexes of two opposing players to mash out combinations to one-up each other in their duel to the death. Sakurai wanted to make a fighting game that would be more accessible and more pick-up-and-play than the more hardcore fighting games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, or Virtua Fighter. He also wanted it to be a four-player game, since the Nintendo 64 would be the only console of its day shipping with four controller ports built in. The result of his inspiration would be a demo he called Dragon King The Fighting Game, featuring four polygonal characters set on a two-dimensional environment running about while beating each other up. It would also feature a damage percentage meter rather than a strict life bar system in order to try and level the playing field between amateur and hardcore players. The way to defeat the other players was to throw them off the screen, not deplete any life bar. The damage meter only influenced how easy or hard it would be to knock a player off the screen and gave some degree of a handicap to ensure that even the best player would likely get knocked off screen at least once during a battle against even the worst player. This project was initially considered, but then passed over in favor of others at the outset of the development time for the Nintendo 64. But, by 1998, it became clear that HAL needed to ship something for the N64 by 1999. So Sakurai was given the go-ahead to revive his little demo as a side project that could be worked on when he wasn't working on other things. And Satoru Iwata would assist him by doing the programming behind the game on his own weekends. Plus, another HAL employee would work on the sound and audio. These three people would sculpt Sakurai's Dragon King demo into something workable, but it was still missing something special. In a case of asking for forgiveness rather than permission, they replaced the more generic polygonal characters with Nintendo characters, and were more than a little surprised to eventually secure Nintendo's reluctant blessing to go ahead with this. Surprisingly, Nintendo of America was more hesitant than Nintendo of Japan to approve this game for fear of the image of Nintendo's family-friendly characters getting violent with each other. But their skepticism was allayed by altering the sound effects of characters hitting each other from fairly recognizable human punching and crunching sounds to more fantastical sounds of inanimate objects hitting each other, like bowling pins. Over in Japan, Sakurai would take his case for the game directly to the public, specifically the fighting game fans by doing something the Smash Bros. series is well known for now, but was brand new at the turn of the millennium. He created a website for the game. Translated to English roughly as Smash Bros. Fist, the site was known as Sumabura Ken. On this homemade site, Sakurai and team detailed every aspect of the game, from the characters to the play modes to how to play the game, all the moves available, and even the hidden characters to be unlocked. The original Smash Brothers released for the Nintendo 64 in January of 1999 in Japan and April 1999 in the United States, with the European launch coming later in November. At first glance, the world didn't know what to make of it. On one hand, it was undoubtedly a fun party game. But it wasn't a graphical showcase like other fighting games were. It featured many of Nintendo's flagship characters and the kind of crossover that hadn't been seen before in gaming, but it also didn't function like any other fighting game out there. Reviews ranged from good to great, hovering between 75 and 85 percent. Respectable, but still a ways away from the near-perfect accolades given to other landmark Nintendo games. It was clearly a wild card in the lineup. But sales of the game were strong, as it joined the roster of other well-known multiplayer games on the N64, including GoldenEye, Mario Kart 64, and Mario Party. It became an evergreen seller for the Nintendo 64 for its remaining time on the market, and could be described as a sleeper hit. Critics pointed out it was relatively light on content though outside of endless multiplayer matches, but fans hoped it would serve as a foundation for a more fleshed out series down the line. Evidently, Masahiro Sakurai felt the same way, since just six months after the game was complete, he submitted a proposal for a sequel on Nintendo's next generation system. While this initial proposal was filed in July of 1999, the actual development of this next Smash Brothers game wouldn't get underway until the fall of 2000, after the GameCube had been unveiled to the public and the development kits were finally ready. With the system's launch set for the holiday season of 2001, this became another title that started under the gun of a tight deadline. This time, the circumstances of development were entirely different, too. The first game had started out as an open brainstorm for something new, 
It progressed as a side project on weekends, and was eventually released as a last resort toss of the dice. Now that the game had taken on the mantle of Nintendo's pantheon of characters, had become a modest critical and major commercial success, expectations were exponentially higher. Additionally, Sakurai's tendency towards perfectionism emerged as he was now entrusted with this major task. He would later say that this was the largest project he had led up to that point, and he threw himself into it like, quote, a man on a mission. This would be the first time him and his team were working on a disc-based game, so the possibilities for higher production values were suddenly opened wide up. This would be the first time they would be working with orchestral music, full motion video sequences, and as he put it, their first real polygonal graphics game perhaps alluding to the fact that the first Smash Brothers game made frequent use of 2D sprites. With all of these possibilities, and a burning desire to prove himself and his brainchild franchise as worthy of Nintendo's name and trust, as well as worthy of the fans' enjoyment, Sakurai and company proceeded to plunge into 13 straight months of development, working on every possible detail and expansion on the original game for its next generation follow-up. The game would be kept entirely under wraps until E3 2001, as one of Nintendo's big surprise announcements at that show when it revealed its opening game lineup for the GameCube. In order to have something special to show how big of an evolution this new game would be, HAL Laboratory contracted with three different computer graphics workhouses in Japan to develop and crunch the introductory full motion video sequence, which beautifully rendered all the Nintendo characters in the style and quality of an animated Hollywood film. But they didn't just come to E3 with a nice trailer, that was just the cherry on top. They came with the full-blown game after just eight months in development. Much like their fellow travelers at Factor 5, who were undergoing a similar crunch development cycle, this very short development time, coupled with the high expectations, layered on top of the infamously brutal Japanese work culture, made for possibly one of the most literally unhealthy development periods ever seen. Sakurai himself would later admit in an interview with Famitsu Magazine that he was, quote, living a really destructive lifestyle, end quote, saying that he worked all 13 months without a single vacation or even a Sunday off. He had initially planned a vacation over the New Year's holiday, but gave that up in order to storyboard the pre-rendered introductory sequence. He described working 40 hours straight, sleeping for four hours, and then returning to work. He admitted during a roundtable on the creation of the soundtrack that after a four-hour session working with the orchestra on the backing track for the intro sequence and meticulously working to make sure the two timed up correctly and thematically, that he actually collapsed and needed to be hospitalized. All this despite the fact that the team working on the new game was up to 50 people, a huge jump from the initial three that started out on the Nintendo 64 game. So what was this new game? On the same day Nintendo showed off the game at E3 2001, a new Smash Bros. website went live in Japan that announced the game as Super Smash Bros. DX, the DX meaning Deluxe. This would remain the Japanese title, although the American version was given the subtitle of Melee. But the Deluxe title really indicated what this was all meant to be, the definitive version of Super Smash Bros. It also had a more simple and straightforward reason for being, Sakurai would say in another interview that he wanted to make a game that would put the GameCube forward on the best foot and make a showcase for everything it and Nintendo had to offer. This helps explain how the game started to grow, from just being an accessible fighting game to also partly evolving into a digital museum of Nintendo history. But between E3 and its release just after launch, there was still a lot of work to get done, and the mountain of bugs that needed to be squashed in order to bring the game to a fully playable, shippable state was far too high and threatened to delay the game beyond 2001, defeating the point of all the hard work that had gone into making the game under such a crunch in the first place. It was in this make-or-break moment that an old friend stepped back into the breach. Satoru Iwata had done such an impressive and well-regarded job turning around HAL Laboratory during the 90s that in 2000 he was invited to join Nintendo's leadership as the head of worldwide corporate planning, as well as joining its board of directors. He quickly became deeply ensconced in Nintendo's internal affairs, jet-setting around the world to do everything he could with his combined knowledge of hardware, software, business, and the industry as a whole to streamline Nintendo's operations and guide the company towards its vision and goals of making the best games possible. 
But in mid-2001, after catching wind of the last development hurdles the Smash Brothers team was up against, Iwata quietly returned to HAL headquarters and set up shop as the debug captain, sorting through the mountain of bugs that needed to be resolved, reviewing the code directly, and resolving some of it himself. This would actually be Iwata's last job as an acting program engineer before assuming the presidency of Nintendo. So with all the blood, sweat, tears, and a last-minute deliverance from the president's savant, Super Smash Bros. Melee was able to slide just under the wire and make it out on November 21st, 2001 in Japan and December 3rd, 2001 in North America. It hadn't made the launch, but it was the first major title from Nintendo afterwards, and in large part made up for their lackluster additions to the launch lineup. So now we bring ourselves to Super Smash Bros. Melee. As is the pattern for all of Nintendo's games on the GameCube, and true to the Smash Bros. team's propensity for pushing the hardware and putting every feature in, Melee does support progressive scan when you boot it up. Then you're greeted by that intro sequence that required so much work to get right and led Sakurai to a health-related breakdown. And honestly, it's probably the best cinematic sequence introducing and summarizing Nintendo's characters that's ever been made. This is a sequence made before the Smash Bros. series knew how big it was, or at least would become. So, but for a few cuts of gameplay, it just shows each character within their own game universe, rather than looking epic or edgy. It was a simpler time. The title screen and intro menus take up a clean, digital, ethereal design. It's a very neutral futuristic that doesn't give away the contents of the game itself. Again, this reflects the very deliberate efforts of the team to mark this as the deluxe version of Super Smash Bros. This kind of clean, futuristic presentation is the pedestal on which they are presenting this game to you. Although the opening menu only has one more option than the first game, this very dramatically obscures how much more content is packed into this game. Normally, we just skim through the options menu, as there's not too much in there. Not in this case. The options menu includes some interesting and different things many games don't. Even the Data Erase option is built out more than the usual settings for this, since you can clear specific areas of the game piece by piece, like clearing your trophy selection, clearing your unlocked hidden characters or levels, or clearing your fighting records. There is the standard setting to enable or disable rumble, and to set what kind of sound setup you have. A curious fact that surround sound isn't present, since this game seems to have included every other modern cutting-edge piece of tech. But Smash Bros. is also a very stationary game on a two-dimensional plane, so I can't really imagine a way that surround sound would do very much or even be noticeable when playing. What's also in the options that was virtually unheard of is a language option that allows you to change the game between English and Japanese, and an option to turn on or off the deflickering effect, giving you the choice between sharper graphic appearance with the possibility of observing more jagged edges to objects, or to have softer graphics that obscure those rough edges while making the overall picture a little bit blurrier. Since I was playing this on an HD CRT in progressive scan mode, I imagine these effects were somewhat muted compared to a regular component output on a standard definition CRT television. But the moir effect in this particular TV pattern was the only standout difference, showing how much the deflicker can blur close items like these parallel lines. The front menu also contains a data section, which is basically more options or miscellaneous non-gameplay areas. It'll let you check screenshots you take during certain modes in the game, it'll keep all of your statistics and records from playing, and it'll offer up a record of all the special things you've unlocked and encountered. Since I captured this from a nice, clean slate save file, there's no records recorded here yet, though. The one extra tidbit here is the archives which contains the How to Play video that rolls from the front screen if you leave it sitting too long. This is also a much improved and dressed up version of the How to Play sequence from the Nintendo 64 game. The other thing though is the special movie, which is labeled as a bonus video, which appears to be a bunch of sequences for each character stitched together into one surprisingly long video. But the video also appears to be directly captured footage from gameplay since it's shrunk down to a 4x3 aspect ratio, even if you're on a widescreen display. The video quality is also a bit lower since it's a compressed movie file. It's kind of an odd addition, perhaps just fun sequences the developers had put together that they found no other use for. Moving over to the actual gameplay sections, we're looking at the one-player mode and the multiplayer versus mode. 
Technically, the versus mode doesn't have to be multiplayer. You can just play against computer-controlled characters. In fact, the versus mode is the area where we have the actual option for a melee, which is just a good way of demonstrating that this is the very core nucleus of the game. Just a straight-up fight that everything else is built off of. The additional versus modes for special melee and custom rules allows you to both make your own type of match by tweaking pretty much every aspect of the game, short of the fundamentals of how you play it, or if you want something to be challenged by, you can take up some of the developer-created custom matches in the special melee section, where they set up very specific limits for how you play, including interesting scenarios like only using the A button, or instant death where everyone starts with a very high damage rate. But really, the important thing in Versus mode is the good old melee, since that's the mode you'll fire up to play the classic local multiplayer battles with your friends. There's also the tournament melee, which is essentially the ultimate multiplayer mode, since it lets you set up a tournament stack, ranging from one-on-one -on -one to up to 64 people getting in on the action, setting the stage for making Smash Brothers tournaments into a real-life event that could take place outside the living room, and moving it into the real competitive arena. However, unlike in the first game, this time they set out to really bolster the single-player mode to give the game some more value for when you're sitting down on your own before your friends come over. In fact, you can start getting some practice in before you try and compete with other people in the training mode, which drops you in the map of your choice, with the character of your choice, against the opponent of your choice, and just lets you go to town on them as they stand there doing nothing. That is, until you change the settings to give them some kind of AI to evade, attack, defend, etc. You also have the Stadium mode that gives you some mini-games. You have the Target Smash mode, carried over from the first game, the Multi-Man Melee, which sets you up in a basic stage against the wireframe models, ranging from just a few to an infinite stream of them that don't stop until you lose. There's also the most curiously out-of-place minigame called the Home Run Contest, which sets you up on a little platform with a giant sandbag with eyes and a baseball bat. Your objective here is to use whichever moves you can to drive up the sandbag's damage in less than 10 seconds without knocking it off the platform, and then give it one big strike with the home run bat to try and send it flying as far as you can. Since Samus is my primary character, I had significant trouble finding a move that would drive up the damage without knocking the bag off the edge, so I didn't get any good hits in. Moving on from the stadium events, there's also the event matches, which are just certain challenge fights set up thematically, such as having Mario fight Bowser, racking up coins as Ness, a fighting ring full of bombs, or going up against a flood of Kirbys. It's kind of the custom matches from the special melee, only in this case the rules of the game itself aren't changed, only the kinds of matches you're pitted up against. All these modes are just the sides compared to the main course that is the regular match. This section breaks down into two choices. The classic mode works the same way as it did in the first game, setting the player up on a series of different fights or levels in a set order, culminating in the showdown with Master Hand. The new crown jewel of single player content is the adventure mode, where you get a lovely sweeping presentation of each level you're set up to play, and these levels are specific to this mode. They're not just standard smash fights in the arena, although there are certainly plenty of those fights sprinkled throughout, but instead, you're given a straight-up 2D platforming section, utilizing the same Smash Brothers control and moveset that you're used to. Each of these 2D levels is set in the universe of one of the Nintendo franchises in the game, such as the Mushroom Kingdom or a Hyrulean Dungeon. Although this mode starts out with these neat levels, it also quickly devolves into the same one match after the other that the classic mode offers, with simple wraparound segments at the beginning and the end giving some faint story elements to how you ended up in each of these standard melee arenas. This section also culminates in a battle with Bowser instead of Master Hand. One of the nice touches the game includes is that either of the single player modes also gives you an interactive credit sequence, where the developers' names all fly by the screen in an arcade style shooting gallery. And if you hit them, it gives you information about that particular person's role in the project. It's a very good tribute to the folks who clearly worked very hard to get this game done and in our hands. Of course, all of this is just the surface level stuff you're presented with when starting the game fresh. As you play through different modes, particularly the single player mode, and meet certain requirements, most of which are not told to you, 
you'll encounter and be confronted by a new hidden character and have the chance to defeat them in battle in order to unlock them for your roster of playable characters. Just in my first run through both single player modes, I unlocked Jigglypuff and Luigi. I don't even remember what the criteria was for unlocking Jigglypuff, but Luigi's criteria involved ending the first level of adventure mode with a time on the clock ending in the number 2, as in 3 minutes 52 seconds, or any other time ending in 2. Of course, the annoyance that'll come in is that you need to complete the single player mode in order to get the chance to face this character, so if you lose to them, you'll have to do it all over again to get another chance to try and beat them and add them to your lineup. Similar challenges and requirements throughout the game also leave you the ability to unlock new arenas as well. I just didn't unlock any during my playtime, since if you had to wait for me to play and unlock everything in Melee, you wouldn't be seeing this episode for months and months. During the single player mode, you'll also start to notice something sitting along at various points of the 2D levels. And there's also just a minigame stage in the classic mode that tells you to gather them. I'm talking about those trophies. By the turn of the century, the video game industry was just over 20 years old, so it was starting to get into its own nostalgia cycle, where long-time players started looking back on their history. Namco made this approach somewhat well-known with its Namco Museum series on the PlayStation, that included fully rendered 3D museums you could explore to check out behind-the-scenes documents and pieces of their game's history. While Sega's Shenmue featured a range of previous Sega characters as tiny figurines you could choose to collect as you played the game. Being the oldest company in the business, and having one of the most storied and cherished histories, it was only a matter of time before Nintendo started doing something like this to celebrate its past. And no game would be better for that than the first major crossover series with Smash Brothers. Plus, as Sakurai explained in a number of interviews, they would get so many requests from so many people for different Nintendo characters and references to be included in Smash Brothers that they couldn't possibly implement them all. The trophies solved this problem, as well as allowing them to give as much fan service as they possibly could without needing to bend the game to include everything Nintendo's ever done. While you can find trophies at different points in the single player game, you are also rewarded coins based on your performance in each match as well and once those add up to tokens, you can take them over to the trophy section of the main menu and try your hand at the slot machine to get new trophies at random from there too. The trophy section also lets you sort through what ones you have so far, either in a simple menu gallery mode where you can examine each trophy up close and rotate it around in nicely rendered 3D. There's also a mode that lets you examine the totality of your trophy collection on a tastefully rendered table that as you grow your collection turns out to be set up in a little house of Nintendo consoles, as the background shelves you can zoom out to see more and more of shows Nintendo's entire hardware history on display up until that point. There's also a book I couldn't make out or identify at all. Leave a comment if you know what that is, I couldn't find an answer. But I really don't want to glance over the trophies too quickly. For while they're just nice 3D models with no real interactivity or use in the game itself, they certainly did their part for me as a kid in creating a certain organized mystique to Nintendo's back catalog pantheon. And I was not alone, since it introduced many players to characters, franchises, or games they might not have been familiar with, and helped create a halo effect to popularize lesser known Nintendo games. In fact, since the North American version included trophies for games that were never released outside of Japan, this introduced many Americans to some games they'd never heard of, and would even help Nintendo in pushing some of these franchises across the big pond in the future. But notice, I do keep saying Nintendo games and Nintendo franchises. This was entirely limited to Nintendo's own first-party published games. But with as expansive and all-inclusive as Melee was, that certainly led many fans to wonder, quite loudly, if other companies' games were in there. Since many of the hidden characters were not fully documented, and the internet was still not a constant and daily presence in everyone's lives back at that time, there was some genuine mystery as to what other things the game was hiding. This led to many rumors and speculations on unlocking characters like Sonic the Hedgehog now that he was on Nintendo systems, or perhaps other characters that were well suited to fit into the Nintendoverse, like Rayman. In fact, during development, Sakurai said that he was indeed approached by Yuji Naka of Sonic Team and Hideo Kojima of Konami to include Sonic or Solid Snake, respectively. 
but the game was way too far into development when they made these requests to actually include them at that point. But the Smash Brothers team would certainly keep in mind the enthusiasm that other companies and creators had had to get into the Smash Brothers universe in the future. Of course, we've taken a look at all these things without answering a primary question. How does it play? What's Smash Brothers Melee like as a game? Well, if you're watching this, the chances are high you know how Smash Brothers plays in general. It's one of the most popular games of all time. But the zeitgeist that's generally maintained by gamers and fans is that Melee is the best one, and that it plays the best, the tightest, and the fastest. Well, I can't really declare if this one is the best one. That's not really within the context of what we're doing here on Croncube. But yes, Melee most certainly controls very tightly and very fast, and it is most likely to hold that crown indefinitely for two reasons, one technical and one personal. The personal one first is that Sakurai himself has said after the fact that he regrets Melee getting so well tuned to hardcore fighting players that it became less accessible to new players, which is after all what he set out to do when designing the first game. So future games did step back a bit from being too twitchy. On the technical side, the Rust development cycle left certain gameplay bugs and game-breaking abilities intact that could later be questionably reinterpreted as features such as the infamous Wave Dash, or L Cancel, which would be squished in future iterations. This was also the last game that started from the default assumption that it would be played on a CRT television with a wired controller. While a GameCube can certainly be hooked up to future LCD TVs, and Nintendo themselves would be shipping a wireless controller at some point soon, future titles would need to be made to account for those differences in responsiveness from Square One which the most hardcore players will tell you does have an impact on split fractions of a second differences in responsiveness. Of course, the gameplay itself, like much of the rest of the game thus far, is a refined polishing of the original game, enhanced mainly by the ergonomic improvements of the GameCube controller over the Nintendo 64 controller. You have your plain standard attack, the special attack, the quick stick flicking smash attack, up attacks, down attacks, the shield, the grab, jumping movements of course, and camera controls. All of these are much more comfortably mapped to the GameCube controller. So comfortably mapped that the GameCube controller is practically considered the default controller for all Smash Brothers games that followed, and is the sole reason the GameCube continues to live on over two decades later. On the graphics and sound front, both of these are among the absolute best on the GameCube a remarkable achievement for a game coming so close to the system's launch. With full 480p progressive scan support running at 60 frames per second, and even the earlier mentioned sharpness settings, Smash Bros. Melee is an absolute technical tour de force. But it's also a game that, although it does draw polygonal environments and characters, it still presents and plays with them on a two-dimensional plane. So I couldn't honestly say that it outranks or even equals Rogue Squadron 2, but certainly the degree of detail in the models, the animations, and the textures in each character, item, and obstacle, in addition to the flawlessly reimagined and rendered levels and environments, these are visuals that stand the test of time very well, and helped make the argument for Nintendo's contention at that time that game visuals were all going to be marginal improvements from here on out. Of course, once some textures get too close to the camera and their lower resolution qualities are visible, the age starts to show, but in December of 2001, it was one of the best games that had been seen to date, and compared to the game it was replacing from the Nintendo 64, this was as big a leap, possibly bigger, than when Soul Calibur came out on the Dreamcast and blew away the previous blocky predecessors on the PlayStation. Of course, the soundtrack absolutely needs to be highlighted for the role it plays in setting the tone and the mood of the game, with the main theme bringing the adequate level of pomp and circumstance to this most highly esteemed of Nintendo's productions. But each musical piece for the respective franchises are also full-blown orchestral overhauls of what previously was rendered with computer-generated sounds and samples, and would set the stage for actual orchestral presentations of video games that would follow. The soundtrack would even be one of the rare inclusions with Nintendo Power in a future issue. Taking these classic video game tunes into the real world of classical and orchestral music was another major step in showing how serious and beloved an art form video games are, and how similar they really are to other forms of art, 
since all these original chip tunes translated so beautifully but so simply into real instrumentals. So with all the fit, finish, polish, gameplay, content, ear and eye candy, spot on performance, and a major amount of hype, there was no doubt that Super Smash Bros. Melee would be a major success on the GameCube, and would play a major part in saving Nintendo's bacon during its middling launch in 2001. What was less foreseen was that Super Smash Bros. Melee would actually go on to become the best-selling GameCube game of all time, with little over one in three GameCube owners worldwide purchasing the game. This is a feat no other game in the franchise has accomplished, and deservedly so because Super Smash Bros. Melee is an undeniable showcase for the GameCube, and an undeniable masterpiece for the ages.